Today is March 31st, 2019. My name is Omar Rodriguez Ortiz, and I am interviewing Victor Benjamin Nelson Cisneros for the Voces Oral History Project. We are sitting in Corpus Christi, Texas. Professor Nelson Cisneros, uh, thank you for sharing your perspective with us. As we have already explained, your interview will be housed in the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection. Please know that if there is anything that you do not want to talk about, you do not have to. And if there is anything you do want to talk about, and I do not ask about it, please feel free to interject. Okay? Let's get started. Tell me, uh, Victor, tell me about growing up in Brownsville. How did it look like? How did it felt like? What do you remember about it? Well, <clears throat> My father passed away when I was five years old. At the time, we were living in Hardinger, Texas. And, um, you know, I had a typical idyllic childhood with my mother and father there. Um, when he passed away, I was with him at the back of the HEB where he had gone to get some water so he could take his glycerin. He died of a massive heart attack. Uh, from Brown, uh, from Harlingen, he was buried in Brownsville. We moved to Brownsville with my grandmother and my grandfather, who owned a small flower shop, La Floreria Cisneros. And I grew up in Brownsville. Um, within six weeks, I was a fluent Spanish speaker, because in the neighborhood we lived downtown, and the neighborhood I lived in, you had to learn Spanish, otherwise you wouldn't survive. And so I learned Spanish right away. And I've been bilingual and bicultural the rest of my life. Uh, Brownsville was a small city. Uh, I guess when I got there, it was probably 55,000 at the most and stayed at 60,000 for the longest time. And I think it was 90% Mexican, uh, Mexican-American. And of course, being on the border, it was a border city with Matamoros on the other side, Matamoros being much larger. And we lived in a binational, bicultural community. Um, I went to, because my father was Lutheran and of Swedish origin, I went to a, a Lutheran school and a Lutheran church all the way through seventh grade. In seventh grade, I transferred to St. Joseph's Academy which was two blocks from my house in downtown Brownsville, uh, a school run by the Maris Brothers. There was a small school. I started in seventh grade and I graduated from St. Joseph Academy in 1963. Uh, when I graduated, the, the school had moved to a new location on the edge of what is known as Rancho uh, Rio Viejo, which is, was at the time and still is a very distinguished community, very high cost housing and so on. Well, I uh, played basketball through my freshman year and I quit basketball because I needed to work in order to pay my way through St. Joseph's Academy because I had transferred there in the seventh grade. Um, I did that willingly. I really had ambitions to be a great basketball player, and I was pretty good. But, you know, things first things first, and I had to pay my way through school. So I had moved there. I graduated in 1963 in a class of 45. Why was education so important in your family? Well, our my mother always said that the only way to get ahead in life was to become educated, to be educated. And uh, she meant going to school and going to college. And that was the expectation in my household. And it was my, the expectation forever. Um, and is the expectation today with my own great nieces and great nephews. Uh, we're, I mean, we already have one in college attending Texas a and I, I mean Texas A&M in uh, McAllen. 
So, yes, I mean, the main reason was because of uh, what our family insisted on, but also because I had had a number of jobs that had pointed me in the direction of higher ed. When I was an undergraduate at the junior college in Brownsville, TSC, where I got my Associate of Arts degree, I worked at the USDA Research Lab, and my intention at that time was to become a biologist, a scientist. Um, and once I took chemistry, that was the end of that. So I pursued history and Spanish, and in fact, I studied history with someone who's being interviewed today, Ward Alvaro, uh, who was a professor of history at Texas A&I in Kingsville, which is now Texas A&M. And let me go back a little bit. You said that uh, once you moved to Brownsville, you learned to speak Spanish right away. What language, uh, in which places did you speak Spanish and in which places did you speak English? I spoke Spanish everywhere. Uh, and I spoke English as well when I needed to. I mean, there was no, no problem. I was fully bilingual. Uh, my mother my, and my grandmother and grandfather was a monolingual Spanish-speaking household. So we spoke Spanish every day, all the time. Uh, but I went to school and learned English and also spoke English well and learned to speak it well while I was doing that. I uh, really didn't make a distinction about where English was permitted and where it wasn't. I mean, the culture is such there in Brownsville, it's so Mexican that, I mean, Spanish is spoken on the street. Everybody speaks Spanish. And at school? At school, we spoke Spanish in school as well, at the Catholic school I went to, and we also, there was one other Chicana, at the Lutheran school that I went to, Esther. And she and I would speak Spanish, my brother and I would speak Spanish, but the rest of the kids didn't speak Spanish. So we spoke mostly English there. And it was because of the, the environment more than anything else. Okay. And uh, you told me that, uh, that your father died when uh, you were five years old. That is correct. Uh, how did that affect your family? besides the, the obvious loss of a, of a loved one? Well, it was, it was hard, very difficult. Uh, as I said, we moved and with my grandmother and my grandfather. Uh, in Mexican culture and families, it's known as los, los arrimados. Nos arrimamos con nuestros abuelos and they were glad to have us. And my mother helped in the flower shop, paying bills, collecting bills, those kinds of things. Uh, she had an opportunity to remarry, but the person she wanted to remarry with, neither my brother nor I approved of, because he was a drunk and a shrimper, and we, we just didn't approve of it. So she remained unmarried, throughout her life uh, and raised us two boys. And we've gone on and done quite well for ourselves coming from that kind of a background. Do you know, uh, did your mother ever tell you how she met your father? Yes, uh, my father had come, he was a farmer's son out of Nebraska. When the depression hit, he jumped on a train going south, trying to beat out the banks as they were closing. He got to Brownsville, he had 10 cents in his pocket and was broke and was not able to get any money. He became a dishwasher at the Texas Cafe in Brownsville. My mother, at the time, worked around the corner in a, in a department store known as Valentin's. And uh, he met her there, asked her to go out, and given the time, she was a 19th century woman, 
She said, you have to ask my father. She was 27 or 29. You have to ask my father for permission. So he did. And he was two younger, two years younger than my grandfather, my mother's father. So he went in and he asked permission to see her. They started dating um, and got married. And had me uh, in 1945. The, were you able to maintain any kind of relationship with your father's side of the family? Uh, we did have a relationship with his two sisters who were unmarried, uh, Esther and Alfreda. Nelson. Uh, Esther was uh, an evangelical Lutheran before evangelicals. Very, very devout Lutheran. Alfreda was not as devout. She was looser. She was, and um, she would come and visit in Brownsville. She stayed down the street at Mrs. Somerville's and Miss Castaneda's house. Miss Castaneda was uh, the sister of Carlos Castaneda, the historian for whom the library at the University of Texas is named after, Perry Castaneda. Uh, and he wrote the seven volume history of the Catholic Church in Texas. Uh, so she would stay there. We'd interact with her. She was always trying to get me to go uh, to Lutheran College. She offered to pay my way to Texas Lutheran College in Seguin, Texas. And at that stage in my life, I said, well, if you want to help, you'll pay wherever I decide to go. And uh, she said, no. So I said, that's fine. You don't have to pay. I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll get to school and I'll be able to make it. Don't worry. Can you tell me a little bit more about... Uh... We also traveled to... California when I was 12. We took a train drive, a train trip, three days from Brownsville to Los Angeles. So we spent about a month there, experienced an earthquake. And it wasn't severe, but we were on the second floor of the house and definitely shook the bed. What year was that? Oh man, well I was 12 years old, so calcula 55, 57. Okay. And can you tell me a little bit more what was school like at uh, the elementary, the Catholic school? Well, I didn't attend elementary and Catholic school. I attended Trinity Lutheran School I'm sorry. In, uh, in elementary. And like I told you, there was one other Mexican in the class. Well, I consider myself a Mexican. There's a muji. And uh, basically the grades, I mean, we were a couple of lines was first grade, a couple of lines was second grade. We were all in the same class. Um, it was a good experience. They treated us well. Uh, Playtime, playground time was always uh, what we looked forward to, playing softball, that kind of thing. I was quite athletic as a young man, young boy. So, but I mean, we, we paid attention in school and we did our work and all that, but it was an Anglo school, so it was very different from me. But my grandmother and my, gran and my, my mother would wake us up on Sunday and send us to Trinity Lutheran Church because that was what they had told Dad that they would do. Well, when I finished sixth grade in the elementary school, I was faced with a decision. Where do you go to from there? Seventh grade. So I decided to go two and a half blocks away from my house to St. Joseph's Academy, which was in downtown Brownsville on La Calle Elizabeth. Okay, and so you mentioned that the uh, Lutheran school was uh, mostly Anglo-American. Uh, that school. is correct. Were the, the, the teachers reflected that too? Were they mostly Oh yeah, they were, all, they were all Anglos. The teachers were all Anglos. There wasn't a single person of color in the school, mm -hmm. except for that young girl and my, well, I consider myself, but as you can see, I'm blonde and blue eyes, or, or green eyes, 
and uh, I don't look Mexican. So I always had an advantage because when I went to a and for instance, I had a friend that introduced me to Raza at the student center and he'd start on and start saying stories about eh, gringo pendejo doesn't know a thing and I just see it and so on and they they jump in and start saying stuff. So when we departed the, me the table, I'd stop, I'd come back and I'd say, Senorita, fue un placer conocerlas. And their jaws would just drop to the table, but they never forgot me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when you started seventh grade, was it the same situation? Mostly Anglo students and Anglo teachers, or was there a No, paper? it was very mixed. And uh, there were students from Matamoros who attended St. Joseph's. There were other Mexican students, Mexican-American students from Brownsville that attended, and Anglos. We were a mixed class. How about African-Americans in any of those? No, schools? none whatsoever. And there was an African-American family in town, but they went to the public school. And growing up, uh, were there any people who really influenced you? Could be a teacher or a pastor, or somebody that you looked up to and inspired you to, to be a better person? Uh, the brothers at uh, St. Joseph's Academy. I mean, you were taught to do good work, to be Christian at the Trinity Lutheran School. But I can't say that there were role models or people who encouraged me. Uh, they encouraged me in school, but that was it. At St. Joe, uh, the brothers, I had several brothers, a couple of whom were Mexican-American, one from Laredo, Brother Dominic, uh, who we played basketball with and he was a whiz. Then we had some Irish brothers, I mean, we had all kinds. It was a very mixed group of brothers. They had come, the brothers who were at our school were from the Mexican province, not from the Poughkeepsie province, which is the main province of the Maris brothers, Poughkeepsie, New York. We then got some, the Irishmen came from Poughkeepsie, uh, a couple of other scientists came from Poughkeepsie, but the ones that made an impression were the ones that came out of the Mexican the province. And you mentioned Dominic. Brother Dominic was one. Do you remember his last name? No, Gonzalez, I think. Okay. But we never knew him by their last name. Brother Stephen, who was a science professor, a teacher of science. Uh, and Brother William Mann, La Leona. Uh, so, uh, several. And, uh, I mean, they would encourage you to go to school. They wanted you to do well in school. We also had a Cubano who taught uh, typing. Uh, and he was good. So, you know, it was a typical 1960s, 1950s high school. Did they, did any of them go beyond their regular responsibilities uh, to help you or support you? No. No. Uh, my family was the main uh, support. The school also helped by having me work in the summer, doing repair work, clean up work at the new location of the school, those kinds of things. So I'd go and I'd trim palm trees and do all that. And that was instead of paying a full tuition. The tuition then was relatively inexpensive, about $20 a month. And it's now quite a bit more. It's about $10,000 a year. Let's talk a little bit about higher education now. When did you decide you wanted to pursue higher education? Did you always knew that, or did it come about later in your life? Like I told you, my family always emphasized education. And going to college was not something that was going to be discussed. It was expected. So as I went to Texas, I, I graduated from high school. I went to the local junior college, 
two years, actually three, because I flunked out my first year because I was playing cards too much in the student union. Uh, but I took my medicine, I stayed out a year, came back and finished. Uh, my A degree, then I transferred to Texas A&I in Kingsville. Uh, it was a great experience. I was at the junior college when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, so that's a, that's a very vivid memory. But I was, I was going to go to school. In fact, I, I stayed in school a long time. <laughs> I, I didn't go to the draft. I mean, initially I was I was 4F, uh, so I wasn't going to be drafted. Then when the lottery came out, my number came out to 300 and something, so I wasn't going to be drafted. So I lucked out. But a lot of my friends did, in fact, go to Vietnam. Did you have a counselor in high school that encouraged you to go to college? Do you have that kind of figure in school? We had no counselors at the Catholic school. The brothers would work with you. I mean, they talked to you about college, but mostly it was about doing well in their classes. And that was it. And when you say brothers, and uh, I may understand this, but I want to make sure everybody does, who are these brothers? They're devoted, they have vocations, they're brothers in an order, the Maris order, uh, and they venerate the Virgin Mary, and they're a missionary order, just like the Oblates were. And the priests in the local region in Brownsville were all of Oblate background, typically, and the Maris brothers were also uh, there in, the, in Brownsville, and they also had a school in Laredo. So those, St. Joseph's in Laredo and St. Joseph's in Brownsville. The school was built in 1865. So has a long history in Brownsville. Uh, it was a Catholic school. Most of my friends were going there. So it was an easy decision to, for me to go from Trinity Lutheran to the Catholic school. And then I converted to Catholicism in my freshman year. Why did you do that? Because it felt right, it felt appropriate uh, at the time. And I still, I wouldn't change that. But I can't say that I am a devout practicing Catholic today. And part of the reason has to do with the pedophilia scandal in the church and the way it was covered up. And you said it felt right. Uh, can you tell me why it felt right at the moment to convert to Catholicism? Well, most of my friends were in fact Catholic. My family was Catholic on my mother's side. They went to church. Uh, our church was now the, but it's now the cathedral in Brazil, the Maculada, Immaculate Conception Church. So that's what we grew up with. And then nobody forced me. And no, no brothers talked to me about converting either. I, I, I came to that decision on my own. And you attended Texas Southmost and got your associate's degree, correct? That is correct. And then you went to A&I Kingsville. That is correct. Did you consider any other colleges or universities? No, not really. I had visited Texas A&I with some friends who had been at the junior college from Harlingen, and they had gone a year earlier than me to A&I. So I had gone up and partied with them, and it, it was the right place for me, and as opposed to Pan American University in Edinburgh. I never I felt that, Pan, that a and I was a much better school academically, and it was. And that's the reason why I selected that school. Would you please describe what a and I was like in the mid 60s and early 70s while you were a student? Well, um, it was primarily Anglo. There was about 500 African Americans, a lot of football players, and 
and there was probably 3,000 Mexican Americans, and a total population of about eight or nine thousand. So uh, we, I mean, we were, we formed a campus action party while I was there, ran for student government, took over student government, um, and got active that way. And we were, we also were part of, I was part of, the Political Association of Spanish-Speaking Organizations, or PASO. And we were student activists at the university, sitting on committees, calling for ethnic studies, calling for more faculty, the typical issues of the day, uh, calling for Chicano studies, uh, and so on. And we also harangued other students in terms of the issues of the day. I told you one of our catchphrases was a Mexican with an eighth grade, uh, with an ex, a Mexican with a bachelor's degree had the same earning potential in Texas as a white man with an eighth grade education. And that disparity just was startling and stark for us. So even though we were getting educated, our likelihood of making more money was not necessarily there. Go repeat the question. No, I was going to ask you, which kind of activities did PASO do? Well, besides our meetings, uh, which were usually attended by mostly Chicano students, including quite a few ROTC members. So when the anti-war movement started there, we had to kind of take that under consideration and say, look, we, we support, we're against the war, but we have to support our ROTC members who are in the military. I mean, they can't come out just symbolically and declare against the war. Not one of them went to Vietnam. Not one of them ended up in the military. Some of them did, but they didn't serve in Vietnam. So we had to make that distinction because they were our fellow members. And we were the only PASO student organization in the state. And locally, in the junior high, there was a Mayo organization, Mexican American Youth Organization, chapter at the junior school, junior high school. Okay. And uh, do you remember any s specific event or activity or protest that that meant a lot for you while, uh, while you were uh, being active with PASO? Uh, the junior, junior high students walked out demanding more Mexican-American teachers, more books in the library, ethnic studies to be taught in the junior high, and they marched about 150 or 200 students, some with their parents against traffic in downtown Kingsville. And they were arrested by the local police. And we started picketing the police station. And Anglos from the university would come by and taunt us and try to start fights with us. And we, you know, we just kept picketing, kept picketing and calling for the release. Uh, while we were there, one of our good friends, Eloy, Baby Eloy, we called him, Garcia, he was a local boy from Kingsville, born raised in Kingsville, originally from Dilly. And he knew the local people. He had played football. He knew all the local people. So he went over and talked to the head of the King Ranch who was standing across the street from the police station watching the protesters and their, the cars coming by. And, and he said, you know, he, he heard, Baby Lloyd heard him say, we need to get this over with. I want him released today. Tonight, they have got to be out. And he just told the police that. I mean, they're a major political figure in Kingsville. 
At the time, Kingsville, there was one Mexican American on the school on the school board and one on the city council. So we had that inside knowledge that it was going to come to an end, but we stayed. We kept picketing. We also picketed for about several months the county courthouse. Every afternoon we picket, and the police and the sheriff would come and take pictures of us, and you know the local kind of mem or uh, media outside agitators were coming in and stirring us up. Well, it wasn't outside agitators. We were all students at the university. So when the walkout occurred, I was in, in class and I come out of class and people start coming up to me. They're looking for you. They're looking for you. They want to and it wasn't the police that was looking, it was other students who were looking to let me know that this walkout had occurred and they'd been arrested. So we went down to the police station and organized the counter protest. And in what, what year was this? Oh man, I wanna say 68 or 69. 68 or 69, or oh, that year, in yeah, academic year. And how did the police and the media uh, uh, reacted to these Well, parts. we had a stringer from the Corpus Christi Collar come. We met with them, and we took we met with them, and they said, well, unless there's blood, there's not going to be national coverage. We said, well, there's not going to be any blood. We sure as hell not going to start a fight with the police. So that was out of the question. So the police, there were, I mean, one of the leaders at a and I was a man who's passed away from Robstown by the name of Carlos Guerra. He was very, very important in the student movement there. His brother was a policeman on the Kingsville Police Department. So we had that entrada. The other thing is that there was a long tradition in Kingsville. The dispatcher was a friend of Raza at the university, so anytime people were having parties, if they were going to raid the party, he'd call and let people know, and the cops would get there and there'd be nobody at the party. <laughs> the party had been moved somewhere else. So we had that kind of local knowledge and local connection. But we put on teatro on a back of a flatbed truck. Uh, I played a ranchero. You know, with a gringo, I mean, just talking like a gringo. And a guy, somebody who was inebriated in the crowd, he was ready to kick my butt because of what I had said. No, 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 it's drama, it's teatro, no, no, no le muevas. So it was good. It was a good time. So you didn't feel like the police at that time uh, violated uh, civil or human rights? Well, no, because they weren't clubbing us. And they were not doing that. They just simply marched against the grain in terms of like a one-way street and said, come to the police station and put them all in jail. Were you arrested? No. No, I was not. I was in school at the university when all this occurred. Okay. But the age range was from 10 years old to 49 years old. A mother of one of the children was in fact arrested. So this led to community meetings, school board meetings, and so on. And we had Anglos get up in a school board meeting and say, this points to a problem. You're not paying attention to these students. This is an Anglo telling the school board this. So I mean, it was a, the city had a mixture of political backs, backgrounds. Do you remember the name of that uh, man no, or woman? I don't, I'm sorry, I don't. I bet it meant a lot. That oh, it did, it did. It did, definitely did. And it led to school board members being elected. That protest, the aftermath of that, what happened in the school, school board, that led to more people being placed on city council and on... Uh, School, uh, school board. 
I mean, one thing that the Mayo students organized, and it was a friend of ours at the college who did this, he discovered or called on Chicanos in the area to turn in their humble Exxon credit cards because there was a district office of Humble Oil in Kingsville. And people started turning in their credit cards. Man, and the reason for it, they said, turn in your cre credit card because they don't have a single Mexican-American on their engineering staff. Well, before you know it, they had two or three. So it was a direct economic result. And it led to political change in Kingsville, definitely. And were you part of any other organizations throughout your time in college? Uh, the Spanish Club. That was it. There was also the Laredo Club. I, I wasn't from Laredo, but they had very pretty girls from Laredo, so I made sure I was part of that club, too. And you, you, also, you, were, you were also part of the student council? I also was a member of the student council well, for what, a short time. What was your position? No, ni me acuerdo. So I, that's why I think some research in the student newspapers at A&I would be helpful. Okay. The Campus Action Party was the name of our party when we took over. Tell me about that, about that takeover that you mentioned over the phone. Well, I mean, Carlos organized it. He was a political genius. He, uh, de la noche a la mañana, overnight, the campus was covered with signs, Vote Campus Action Party. Not Chicano Party, you know, Vote Campus Action Party. I mean, everywhere you went, there were signs. And we had a slate that was running. So, I mean, and we had a slate of women running for the annual festival called the Lantana Festival. Lantana Queen was being voted on. And Homecoming was being voted, Homecoming Queen. We ran a young woman, Jamie Alba, from Encino, Texas, outside of Laredo. Encinal, Texas, outside of Laredo. Beautiful woman. I mean, she was one of the darlings of the campus. She ran for homecoming queen. Anglos ran for homecoming queen, Anglo women. They contested the election four different times. And every time the re-election occurred, her vote count went up 100 to 200 votes. So she just wiped them out as homecoming queen. Then in Lantana, the queen for that was a woman, Linda Salinas from Alice, Texas. We voted her in and her court, and uh, she chose red, white, and green for her Lantana dress. And one of the young women, one of the Anglo women said, oh, that's so Christmassy. And she turned to her and said, no, that's very Mexican. <laughs> and what's a lantana dress? Gowns for a ball. They had an annual lantana ball. And there was a queen of the ball and princesses and the whole nine yards. It's a big festivity at the university. So we took that, we took homecoming, and we took over the student government. And when you said they, as well, in a group of people that tried to question the results of these elections, who are they? Anglo women who had lost, thought that we had stuffed the ballot, and we hadn't. Raza just came out and voted. And I mean, they voted four different times. And every time, by 100 points, they'd go up. And you did tell me that there were more white students than uh, Mexican-American students. That is correct. 
why do you think uh, the Campus Action Party was so effective in, in taking over the student council and these other uh, bodies? Well, we just, we were very focused and we got our, our vote out. And not everybody on the Anglo side of the house came out to vote. And we just, it was a landslide. Were there many? Ang there was one Anglo that was elected. And he was an international student. Were there many um, Anglo students that you saw supporting the campus actually? Yes. I mean, we had our local hippies, liberals, progressive, radicals. They all supported us and they all also campaigned with us. And did you feel prepared academically and socially for college? Yes, I think the junior college prepared me very well. Uh, we had, uh, well, socially we were prepared. I was prepared coming out of the St. Joseph's Academy. Uh, they, they prepared us very well to perform. And once at the junior college, I mean, it was a, a local culture. I mean, we hung out together. We played cards together. There were students from San Benito. There were students from Harlingen. Brownsville, and we all interacted and mixed together. We'd visit each other's homes. Their parents would invite us. We'd go to dances in San Benito because they also had very good looking women. Not that Brownsville didn't, but we just had a, a I mean, there was a great am, ambience to this campus. And yes, our social skills were such that we were able to compete. Did uh, the Mexican-American students coming from public schools, did, did you see them struggling more than you academically? No. They were very well prepared too. It was, yeah, it was a good high school. Very, very good high school. And the ones, I mean, we had good teachers at the, at the junior college. Mrs. Foster in English, everybody dreaded taking her, but she was the best instructor in the English department. Dr. Tulos in Spanish, I took him. I mean, just, you knew there was a group of faculty that were very, very good, good teachers. And you ended up going to UCLA for your doctoral program. That is correct, after I spent a year at UT Austin. And what factors enter into your decision to go to UCLA versus other universities? Well, I had been at the University of Texas at Austin, enrolled in a PhD program in Mexican-American studies that was run, directed by Américo Paredes, and the assistant director was José Limón. And José Limón's a very good friend of We became very, very good friends. When I was still at a and I, uh, directing the ethnic studies program there, he came to a and I, didn't know me from Adam, to visit and to talk about a conference they were hosting at, a at Austin. The Mexican-American, what's the name of the group? They had federal funding and they were setting up these meetings on Mexican-American studies in different parts of the country. And they had cho chosen UT Austin and Jose was organizing it. And he came to visit me and to talk to me about attending, which I did. Uh, I'm trying to think of the Mexican-American mobile something. And that was a f group that got the funding. It had raza, pero Washington types. And Jose was raza out of Corpus Christi here. Uh, his father was a butcher, meat market guy, and Jose was a folklorist, an anthropologist, and has become a very, very distinguished anthropologist. Uh, not, no se diga Américo Paredes. So I went and spent a year. The Mexican American Studies program, graduate program, had a seminar that ran. They didn't have a PhD. Dr. Paredes couldn't teach it. So they had Richard Simpkins, a historian in the Latin American program, teach this, although it was run by Jose Limon. And what they did is that they invited Chicano scholars from California, 
Pedro Castillo, Alberto Camarillo, a, a whole group. Jose Juan, at the time, Juan Gomez Quinones was in residence as an NEH scholar at the University of Texas in Austin. And he was involved in this seminar as well. So we'd meet on Thursday nights, late afternoon, early evening. We'd have people come in and talk. Pedro Castillo came in, like I said, Alberto Camarillo. There was a group of them that came in. After the seminar, we had the post-seminar seminar, in which we'd go to Jose's house and drink and get wasted and have a great time and get to know these people and bond with these people really well. So. I, had, I, was, I wanted to study with Juan Gomez. So when he left to go back to UCLA, a year later I followed him. And he told me to apply. I said, sure, I'll apply. So I applied and I was accepted. And there was going to be three of us that were going to go. Emilio Zamora, myself, and Roberto Villarreal. We had all worked with him at, a, at Texas. On a, on a history project, he basically told us, let's, let's, why don't we do Texas labor history, Chicano labor history, uh, we'll divide it up the periods, 1900, 1920, 1920, 1940, 1940, 1960, and gave us each one. He says, and we'll do research on it, we'll write, and we'll critique each other's work, we went, we went to UT Arlington, where the Labor Archive was. It had just been established a few years before. We worked the archive, and one day we went through the whole archive, and we knew exactly what was there. And we used what we needed to use. So we then wrote articles that appeared in Aslan. What is that? Aslan International Journal of Chicano Studies that was published by the Chicano Studies Program at UCLA. And you mentioned, you have mentioned La Raza a couple of times. What does it mean to you when you say La Raza? Well, it depends on the context. Usually at the broad general level, Raza means Latinos, very broadly defined. In Texas, it means Mexicans or Mexican-Americans people of Mexican descent. Um, not much <laughs> gradation on that. It's, that's what we mean when we say, well, for instance, the political party that was started, La Raza Unida Party, La Raza refers to those of Mexican descent in the state of Texas, in my opinion. And how do you identify yourself? Uh, Mexican, Mexican-American? What term do you prefer? I use Mexican and Mexican-American. And Mexican at the very broad, generic level. Not, it's, not, it's not based on citizenship. It's based on culture, background, upbringing. History, all that. Can you tell me a little bit more about Raymond Padilla? Well, Raymond was a psychologist at UCLA. And I went to UCLA and, and I was selected to be a, a Ford Foundation Fellow for the PhD program in history. And I was interviewed by Tomas Rivera and someone else, I forget the other person's name. Uh, I know I'm going on a tangent here, but I'm coming back to that. Uh, and Tomás Rivera basically said, I know him, I don't have to ask him any questions. So he turned me over to the other guy. And they were there representing the Ford Foundation. So I was very lucky. I mean, they, they definitely said, yes, we need to give him a fellowship. So at the time, the Ford Foundation, they needed a house, some place to house this fellowship program. They didn't do it through the history department, where Juan was. They did it through the National Hispanic Mental Health Research Institute. And Ray Padilla 
Raymond Padilla, the psychologist, was in fact the head of that program. So I went there for my fellowship. I had a nice fellowship during the time I was there. And what I did for them was produce a newsletter, an occasion, and, a, and an occasional paper series. And later in life I found, uh, not later in life, but two years, three years later, I found out that this was a newsletter that was read across the country. You know, Chicanos in psychology, I mean, they were reading it front to back. And what kind of person was Raymond Padilla? A very stern, very uh, New Mexican. Así van a ser las cosas. But he let you do your thing once he gave you the instructions. So I knew what I had to do and I did that. No problem. But he had a whole you know, program like your project. Director, assistant director, and staff. It was a very good experience. Yo nunca tuve problemas con Ray Padilla. How did your experience at UCLA compare to Texas a and Oh, it's very different in some ways and not very different in others. Uh, very different in the fact that at a and I, a group of raza and the PASO organization, we were probably no more than 20 students, but we were able to organize a whole university around the issues that we thought were important. UCLA, yo llego a UCLA and you can see what I look like and you know, Raza there didn't know what to make of me. All I had to do was start speaking Spanish, albures, cutting up with them, and that was it. And I met a lot of Raza who were at UCLA who were from the border, from San Diego. So I mean, as soon as we talked Spanish with each other, we connected. They knew exactly who I was and where I came from. So it was never a problem. I mean, I never got called out pinche gringo, nada, ever. So Juan introduced me, Juan was very good about introducing me to all these student movement people in Los Angeles. I mean, a lot, all the major leaders in the in the movement there, the student movement and at UCLA as well as in other parts. And we, our home base was the Chicano Studies program in Campbell Hall. So in that sense, it was also very similar. I connected with a lot of raza there at UCLA and I made some friends, close friends. But I was, you know, I was a hard working student. I was going through microfilm, doing all kinds of stuff. Are you still encountering the issue that your skin is white, therefore you don't fit the, the stereotype of a Mexican and people... Uh, it doesn't bother me. People from the Mexican or Mexican-American side treat you different because of it? Well, no, but it doesn't bother me at all. It's just, and I'm always prone to tell them, you know, never judge a book by its cover. I had a room full of international students de Venezuela. They had invited me to come and speak. So I started out in English and then I switched to Spanish. And I, I told them, don't judge a book by its cover. So I was focusing on immigration issues and I kept telling them, these issues are going to affect you eventually. So you got to get on the right side of this issue. And no, I mean, people responded very positively. And do you think... Uh, it was a language, I mean, culturally and the language that broke down all the barriers, if there were any. Do you think that uh, because your skin is white, Anglo-Americans, while you were at high school and then college, uh, treat you better than other Mexican-Americans, that uh, their, their skin was darker? Probably, but I didn't hang out with Anglos. I hung out with all the, all the raza. 
I mean, we in the student union, we had an area of the student union on top that we controlled, where the jukebox was. And, you know, that's where we hung out. I mean, Carlos Guerra would come into the student union, he'd open the door, and on the front, on the first tier, where all these tables and chairs, where all the Anglos hung out. He'd come in, he'd turn one side, stick his tongue out, turn to the other side and stick his tongue out. <laughs> and then come up to the top. So... Sorry about all the anecdotes. No, no, it's, uh, we love this. Uh, so it seems that there were not violent racial tensions, but there were still tensions and divisiveness between races. Yes. Yes, there were. I mean, we knew that we didn't have the power that they had, but we were going to take it. And we, we went about it in a very systematic way. And we, we thought it through. When I stayed as Ethnic Studies Program Director, we all graduated together, and I was faced with a dilemma. They went to San Antonio, started uh, a, uh, a magazine there. I stayed at Kingsville as the director, and I talked to each of the leaders in the Paso Student Organization, and they all told me, hey, we've been asking for this for three years. Yeah, we think you should stay. Yeah, we think you should be the director. And after that is when Rasunida was started and all that. How many years were you a director? Two years. Yeah. The president of the university had told me, you'll only have this job for two years, then you've got to get on with your life. What, what changes were you able to bring that you can remember that, that meant the most to you while there? Well, we established the program. We started offering classes. Ward Avril was very supportive of us. Uh, Stanley Bittinger, a sociologist at a and I, was very, very also helpful. He would drive us to leadership meetings different parts of Texas, and one of the speakers was a guy out of, now he's out of Wisconsin, by, by the name of Narciso Aleman, firebrand. He'd run all the gringos out, including Stanley. Yo pura chingada, uh -uh. it ain't happening. What do you mean by running them out? He'd ask him to leave before he spoke. And I had guys come up to me and say, you need to leave, uh-uh. Yo soy de aquí. No ten chingando. Excuse me. That's fine. And why why was that important for for the Well, because Stanley took us in his VW bus to these meetings. I mean, and he's still alive, by the way. And he's a wonderful man. No, he's I, a minister. He's he traveled all over Latin America. Muy conocedor, habla español, pero he also let us take over, I mean, be the leaders, be the group. Okay. He never tried to exercise domination. When you were at, um, uh, where was it that you didn't complete your dis dissertation? Why? No, where was it? Well, I w I, when I passed my exams, I was all but AB, I was ABD, all but dissertation. I wanted to get out of Los Angeles. I wanted to go home. So my idea was to go to Austin. Biggest mistake I ever made. And if anybody's watching this, who are pursuing PhDs, never leave your home base until you're finished because that's where your support group is. Never leave. No matter what. I had this notion that I was going to go to Texas and teach. I did. Mexican American Studies at UT Austin hired me. The History Department made sure I was paid less than their graduate students. 
they went out of their way to screw with me. And when I left, I had an interview with the graduate dean and I told him as much. I said, this is what, what occurred. But once I was there, I uh, also was acting director of Chicano Studies at University of Houston. And we tried to recruit Jose Angel Gutierrez to be the director. And I, I, I did all that while I was there. There at UT Austin, I mean, I was a close friend of Jose Limon's and all of that leadership group in the Mexican American Youth Organization. Did I answer your question? Yes. How, how did you feel about not finishing your dissertation? Well, I beat up on myself for quite a while. And uh, when I was assistant dean at Colorado College, I actually got the semester off to try to finish. And I tried, and I couldn't. And I came back and I told the dean, the, my boss, I said, I'll be happy to hand in my resignation now, if you like because I, I'm not going to finish. I finally made up my mind, no way I'm going to finish this, move on with your life. And it was a big burden that was lifted off of me. And, but they, you, you kept working on Colorado College, correct? Oh yeah, I worked there 30 years. And So no, no, the dean said, you're crazy, I'm not going to ask you to resign because you haven't finished. You were one hell of an administrator. What was his name? David Finley. He was a political scientist. Um, who was the first there? Glenn Brooks was a political scientist. He hired me. David Finley followed him. A political scientist hired him. He, he, I also worked with him. Then he was followed by Tim Fuller, also a political scientist. Then he was followed by a biologist, Richard Story, and then followed by Susan Ashley, who was the last dean, a historian, who I worked under at the end. And how did you become aware of the educational disparities in South Texas? What did you see or experience that told you, wait, this is not right? Well, I saw some of the poorer schools in the city. Uh, I knew that there was a disparity in resources. I knew that I was privileged to go to a, to a private school, even though I paid my own way, but the school helped me. Uh, and I was also a member of the Catholic Youth Organization, CYO. So at the time, we had just been declared a new a diocese, Brownsville Diocese. And Bishop Garriga from Corpus Christi was the first bishop of the diocese. He passed within a year or two. The second bishop was a man by the name of Bishop Medeiros, who came to, from Falls Church, Massachusetts. And he was of Portuguese origin. And he was a, a peritus in the Vatican Council, which is an expert. And he did the first census of the Brownsville Diocese. Any church that was white completely, he redrew the boundaries to make sure that they were half Mexican, half white. Some churches were closed down because they refused. He also funded for the United Farm Workers, a plot of land in the valley that they own. He bought it for them so that they could have a headquarters. So he was an enlightened individual. And as a Catholic youth organization and Newman Club member, I was able to meet him and get to know him well. So he was an inspiration to me. Um, so, I mean, it was natural. I mean, besides that, when I was in the Newman Club at the Texas Southmost College, I was chairman of the, of the state convention to be held in Brownsville. So I held 
I put on a convention for all the Catholic Newman clubs in the state of Texas to come to Browns. And of course, the first thing they wanted to do was go to Matamoros. I said, anybody gets caught by police in, in Matamoros, you're on your own. Ain't nobody coming to save you. <laughs> That's the first thing I told them. And you saw those... Uh... Those activities were fundamental to my formation politically and ideologically. And when did you start noticing that the universities were also not being funded as they should, especially the universities in the south compared to the universities in the north of Texas, in the center of Texas? Well, I mean, the so-called permanent fund that University of Texas and A&M have tapped into based on oil in the Permian Basin, they have tapped into that fund for years. None of that stuff was coming to A&I, Pan American, Corpus Christi, none of it. So we knew about that disparity in funding. And we basically had a board of trustees. They met, they'd present a budget to the legislature. It'd get funded by the legislature. That was the process. So we knew of the inequity. But I had an enlightened president at Texas A&I who went to the Board of Trustees and said, we have to fund this line item for an ethnic studies program at Texas A&I, and they did. And how was that, those lack of funds reflected? What were you needing in, your, in the Southern universities that you needed that money for? More faculty of color, more diversity in the student body, uh, more graduate programs. We didn't have a law school, we didn't have a medical school. It's only now that we have a medical school. It took that long, this is 40 years later at least, that we have a medical school now. Uh, but those lawsuits and so on laid the foundation for the state legislature to pony up more money for these schools. And what did it mean for these And you go to these schools today and they're transformed in terms of buildings and just upkeep, everything. They're just different places. What did it mean for these communities to have more graduate programs? Why were those needed? Well, because we didn't want to leave South Texas and have to go to Austin or Baylor or, you know, some other place to get a graduate degree. We wanted to be able to get a degree close to home. And not everybody could travel to those places. No, because, I mean, we had poor students. Not everybody was successful. I mean, look, I was on financial aid from the time I got to A&I. I went in and I mean, as a graduate student, my financial aid was $750 per semester. Rent, food, everything came out of that. It worked. And we were fortunate to have Manuel Salinas as the director of financial aid and became vice president for financial aid. And he took care of us. He says, did you, you didn't work this summer, did you? That's the way he posed the question. You didn't work this summer, did you? No, sir. Put zeros. Put zeros all along it. Increase our financial aid. And was there, do you remember of any specific anecdote or moment that really helped you picture of these disparities between the, the colleges in Texas? Something that made you realize it was so obvious it was right there you could see it and the experience well, we it. were very aware of the difference between public universities and private universities uh, trinity university was one i mean there were quite a few others but we knew that the funds that the schools had was in fact limited there wasn't a lot of uh, surplus money if you want there wasn't a lot of buildings going on. It was limited. Local contributors created 
the uh, Gladys Porter Re Student Center at Texas Almost College was built by a local daughter of the J.C. Penney founders. So the Gladys Porter Zoo, which is a zoo in Brownsville dedicated to uh, species that are going extinct. So, I mean, those things were all donated locally. There's no state funding for it. So that's how I knew. And how were, how aware were you of the South Texas Border Initiative? Tell me what it was. No, I would like for you to, to tell me how was it well, through research, through news, through part of your activism, how, how did you learn to know about all that? If you mean the border initiative about the, the lawsuits that occurred against the University of Texas, against the Texas uh, Department of Education, so on, I knew because the person who adjudicated that case was in Brownsville, Judge Uresti, and he found against the university. So that's how I knew. Local, it was a local issue. And I, I, my consciousness at that point, I mean, the Mexican American Education Project had just published a book on Mexican American people. I mean, I was researching and active in all of that since the 60s. And I lear I've learned that uh, that there were people who felt like students in the border region didn't have the academic capacity to succeed at large, more prestigious universities, and they would use that argument as an excuse not to give uh, extra funding or or the the, the to, to give the funding that these uh, colleges needed. I never heard that myself. Mm -hmm. uh, we would consider that to be a slur, a slight against students and schools in South Texas. Because I think if you look at Laredo, at Brownsville, the number of medical doctors, pharmacists, PhDs who come from those towns, I, I will put it up against any other town. That's just not the case. And there's no lack of academic preparation, there's no lack of intellectual capacity in those regions. And during those years, what were the problems Mexican Americans were facing in Texas? Well, the schools, clearly underfunding of schools, the need for more school board members, city council members. We were politically uh, ostracized, if you want. We weren't as powerful politically. Where we were a large number in the population, yes, there were Mexicans. The first federal Mexican-American federal judge was Reynaldo Garza in Brownsville. And he was appointed by Kennedy, I believe. So those kinds of political things occurred. But we knew that we were uh, los olvidados. Did you, were there also any big differences in terms of infrastructure in the Mexican-American neighborhoods versus the Anglo-Americans? Yeah, but it wasn't. It Water, wasn't, electricity, No, roads. I mean, yes. That whole area is renowned for colonias. These are basically squatters camps. No utilities, no electricity, and they either build houses or they take over houses that are in this neighborhood of unincorporated area. So it's up to the county or the city to incorporate them. <coughs> and they have to extend the services. Right now, I, I live in a neighborhood that is separated by a resaca, man-made. There's a school next to me, and la entrada to a place called La Villita. That was, at one point, a colonia, unincorporated. You get lost in it.
because no street sign, nada. But now it's part of the city. So the city has taken them over and provided services. But that, that is an example of the extreme poverty that still exists in South Texas. And this was in Brownsville? Yeah, that's where I was born and raised. You were talk we were talking over the phone about a speech you made uh, when you started working at Colorado College. And you also mentioned uh, the word uh, the words uh, super Mexican, that you were not a super Mexican. Can you tell me that story and what what do you mean by super Mexican? Well, I was I was working for the National Rural Center doing research in Houston on job growth in the non-metropolitan Sun Belt. I got a phone interview from the hiring committee at Colorado College. So in the phone interview, I told them, I said, if you expect me to be a super Mexican, and by that I meant you wanted me to come in for a position as assistant dean, I was going to recruit students, I was going to counsel students, I was going to teach students, and I was going to make sure that they stayed in school. I said, I'm not that person. I will learn to be the assistant dean of the college, and I will help minority students as well as all students while I'm at the, at the college. So don't expect me to do that kind of a job. I'm not going to do that. I was very upfront with them. And tell me about that speech. Uh, what, what was happening that day? What event was it? And uh, what did you say? And how did people react about it? Well, I, I, uh, I took it. I applied at Colorado College. Uh, I had gone to lunch with Glenn Brooks. And he had told me about the position. And the only agreement we made was that I would apply. So I applied. There was about 150 applicants, and I was one of three finalists. And I know all three finalists, I mean, I, myself and two others. And we, long and the short is, I was hired. And the two, one was a PhD in psychology, another one was a PhD in English. PhD in English left after the first day because he wouldn't answer the students' questions. The second person came after me, and I knew her. She had been a student at Michigan and was a good friend of my brother's. My brother had been Chicano advocate at the University of Michigan. So we had a chance, and I interviewed, I went to campus, I presented my research that I had done in history, I uh, had a, a great, and I loved the students. The students were very, very political, very, not afraid at all, very sophisticated, very well educated. So I said, this is, you know, this is a place I can, I can be at. And I, the students knew I wasn't going to be pampering them. There had been an assistant dean before me who was, at the time, was at the University of Texas, Rodolfo de la Garza. And I had gone to lunch with him, and he told me about the dean coming to town. Well, Rodolfo, he would organize events for them, bring speakers in for them, and all that. And I told him, I said, no, that's your responsibility. You have got to learn how to do that, and when to do it, and how, where. So they did. I said, I'm here. I'm a resource person. I can talk to people. I'll make contacts for you, whatever you want. Just tell me. But I'm not going to be bird dogging you all the time. And you were saying, so, yeah, go ahead. The, when I came to campus, I came in in August. First thing I did was that I went into the presidential archive and looked for the annual Minority Concerns Committee reports. And I reviewed those for the last 10 years. I read all, every one of them in preparation for what later turned out to be a talk to the faculty 
and to an incoming president. Because I came in at the same time as a new president by the name of uh, Gresham Riley, who was coming from the University of Richmond. The president that was there and he was replacing was a, a longtime historian at the university, at the college, by the name of, of Lou Warner. Lou Warner, I came in and interviewed with him when I went for my interview, and he had one question. Why do you want this job? I said, because I don't have a job come September. <laughs> I, uh, that's one of my characteristics. I've always been very frank and direct. And I don't beat around the bush. Caiga como caiga. So he said, well, thank you very much for your honesty. What do you, do you, you have any questions about the college? And I asked several questions. So once I had come and I had been hired, Glenn Brooks, who was dean of the faculty, asked me to speak at the fall faculty conference, which is an annual meeting to open the school year. And this was the, Regression Riley was gonna be there. I was speaking and they invited an African-American professor from the University of Colorado Boulder to speak, an English professor to speak as well. So, you know, I got up and spoke, and I had prepared remarks, I had statistics, I had information from the Minority Concerns Report. So I basically kind of laid out what I thought the college needed, and based on the Minority Concerns Committee reports, said, you know, we don't want any special treatment. Well, you know, that's not what we're asking for. Minority students want to be treated like every other student. We want you to set the same expectations for them and to push them and help them achieve those expectations. I said, look, some of you are teaching students that have perfect scores on the math section of the SAT. I said, those kids teach themselves. I said, the ones that you, your mark as a teacher, and I was tell, talking to the faculty, your mark as a teacher are going to be the students who don't have the high scores, but who have potential, and you can bring that out of them. I said, that's the mark of a good teacher. So that's the story. And it, it went very well. I was very well received. You know, I mean, you could hear a pin drop in that. I mean, I had a faculty member from the English department basically get up and say, you know, when you're selecting literature for a, a literature class, you need to make sure that the literature is of high quality. And I said, Professor, you and I have a difference of opinion. I said, you, the underlying assumption that you're making is that when minority scholars select literature in a literature class, it's not of the same quality as when you select literature. I said, that is not true and totally wrong. I said, we and I, you and I have a difference of, oh, no, I didn't mean that. I said, well, that's the way I interpret it. We apply the same rigors of scholarship that you do. After all, we are trained in the same academy. Was this the same professor who you said over the phone that misinterpreted your message and thought you... Well, that was a different professor. You... During that talk, I basically said, look, we need to increase the number of diverse faculty on the campus. So if you have a diverse candidate in your hiring pool, you need to separate that application and look at it very seriously as a hiring committee. You can still make the decision not to bring them to campus, but you have to compare them to what you bring into campus. And if they are the same, similar or better, you need to bring them to campus and put, include them in the pool. Well, that was interpreted as me arguing for affirmative action in the hiring process at Colorado College. And that's not what I was saying. You gotta give them the same chance. You got to bring them to the fore and have them be thoroughly vetted. That's what I meant. And 
that resulted in that faculty member talking to the dean, saying that I had said that. He called me and said, would you please meet with her? I said, be happy to, I did. I, I, I didn't meet with her, I met with the chair of the department. I said, I met with him, we had a great conversation. He writes the dean a note because he was a total gentleman. He wrote the dean a note saying, Victor and I have met, I'm in total agreement with his position on this question. He was misinterpreted. That is not what he meant. Thank you. I couldn't have asked for anything better. But I was asked again by a professor, a chair of sociology, to meet with him to review this as well. And I told the uh, dean of the time, Glenn, I said, look, I'd be happy to meet with him if you insist and want me to meet with him. I said, but for me, it's an insidious form of social control. I have to watch every single thing I say. I said, that's no way for me to have a successful career here. He said, no, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Do you think it was only a misinterpretation or do you think these people had all two No, I think, I think they misinterpreted because I had given a f much fuller explanation in the speech. I mean, I told him, I said, we don't want any special treatment. And in what year was this? 1981, summer of 1981, late summer, early August, um, late August. <coughs> and what does community activism mean to you? Well, for me, it's working with the community that I live in and work at. And that was the college, the faculty and students at Colorado College and staff. I worked with all three. The local community was primarily Anglo. There was a, a local Mexican community, and I did have interaction with them, and I did work with them on some things. But my main focus was my campus and my student body, and you know, that's who I worked with. So that's what it meant to me. I was very focused. And most of your activism has been, I don't know if you agree, by working uh, in the system. True. That's, I mean, it's true. Once I was in higher education at, at UCLA and at, at uh, but I mean, at UCLA, it was Chicano Studies. It was the National Hispanic Mental Health Research Center. At uh, Colorado College, I was, at the college, predominantly white college, but a very liberal arts college and wanting to improve, and they have. While I was there, I founded uh, a program with a couple of colleagues, one from Vassar and one from Williams, uh, minority students uh, and, what was it? No, a dissertation completion fellowship program funded by the schools. And this was in the Associated Colleges of the Midwest. At our school, the most we ever brought were five PhD candidates for a year to complete their work. And some would come in and say, well, will I have a second year? I said, well, no, if you don't finish, you ain't, you ain't gonna do it. So they'd get after it. And most of them did finish. And in some cases, some were hired. The idea was to bring a, a, a good candidate to a department that was searching in that area and let them look at each other and decide where they wanted to pursue it. Did you always believe And we brought 65 PhD candidates in 20 years to the college. And it happened at other colleges as well. What? What do you think that resulted in, in the long term, bringing all these people? Well, it, yeah. it changed the complexion of the faculty somewhat, because now some of those candidates, PhD candidates, are now tenured faculty at Colorado College. Uh, it hasn't, how should I put this, it hasn't minimized the difficulties, because some of them come from very 
privileged schools and think that they deserve all kind of privilege at this school. Well, no. You're a colleague and you have to work with other colleagues. Uh, did you always believe that working within the system was the most effective way in bringing about change? No. No, I, uh, when I was at UCLA, I studied Marxism, Leninism. I read a lot of Marx. Uh, but that was my trajectory, if you want. That's the path that I followed. And I fell into it, to be very honest. I just, I'm not a joiner. What do you mean by that? Well, I don't join organizations. I, I don't, La Sonida Party, they came out, they had a, the first bumper sticker, had a ranchero with a rifle in his hand on one side of the sticker, and it said La Raza Unida. Before you know it, they, did, they were gonna run statewide the original sticker was red, white, and green. The new sticker was red, white, and blue. And it was translated United Together. So I, I, I supported, but I, no, I wouldn't. Why I was that change important to you? Well, it was a fundamental change to who they were. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Just how well, it went for you personally? Well, to me, it had been a Mexican-based organization of opposition. You know, they had taken over the Crystal City Council, City Council. They had, in fact, done the same in a couple of other towns. But when they went statewide, they became no different than a Republican or Democratic Party. They had to hold primaries. They had to get a certain percentage of the vote. They had to raise money, all that. They went from opposition to inclusive or a party just like any other. So that part of my reason. I rather, I preferred the oppositional. Tardando contra. And uh, probably a failed strategy, but And how, how, how has all this experience uh, changed uh, the way you, you see the, the world, or, you know, how, how, how has all this experience changed you as a person? Well, I basically haven't changed a whole lot. I mean, I've got, I've matured, I'm older, my focus and energies are in another area. I'm more selfish, concerned about my self-care. I spent many, many years taking care of other people. So now it's my turn to take care of myself. I still, I consider myself a Democrat. I still support left kinds of leaning projects. I prefer this project I'm very impressed with. And I think the longevity is incredible. And I hope people will continue to support it. And you've got so much that hasn't been covered. So much to do. It really is an important contribution to the history of Mexican Americans in the state of Texas, the history of Mexicans in the state of Texas. And Basicamente, my ideology has not changed that much. I'm less socialist and more capitalist now. Do you still do any kind of activism or support any organization in any way? No, besides contributing money to different causes, no. Like which causes are interest you now? Beto O'Rourke, I, 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 I will contribute to his, but their email and messaging campaign is just overwhelming. I've got nine emails or messages on my phone. In no, I don't like that. And just to clarify for, for people who may watch this 20, Beto, 20 years later. Beto O'Rourke is running for president of the United States in 2020. He's out of El Paso. The Beto refers to Robert. It's uh, changed because he was raised in El Paso, Texas, but he's Anglo. 
Okay. And from privilege. And one last question. Uh, you moved back to Brownsville after retiring. Uh, what do you get in Brownsville that you didn't, you don't get elsewhere? Damn good food, first, first of all. Um, no se diga, the border has the best Mexican food anywhere. Uh, I'm close to my family. I have one brother. That's six. He's married. He's got three children. They've got children. My extended family's there. I have an uncle on my mother's side, 98 years old. I've got other relatives in town. So all my extended family lives there. And I'd rather be closer to them than in Colorado. Okay. Well, uh, Victor, thank you very much for being with us today. We appreciate uh, the effort of coming all the way here and telling us your story. Thank you very and much. And we hope we stay connected. I hope so. And I really commend the project for the work it's doing, and I hope it continues to succeed. Thank you. Thank you.